One man, a pit man, as he was already called, would dig out the coal with a helper, usually his wife, to fetch and carry. were crewed with no support. As much coal as possible was hewn before the sides threatened to cave in. The pit would then be abandoned and another started nearby. One of the ancient laws of the forest of Dean had fixed that a second pit should be at a distance to which a miner could throw a shovel full of rubbish from the pit he had worked out. Drift mines, two or three miners won the coal, while boys or women dragged it to the entrance. Then the need for coal increased. By the 14th century, artisans were using it extensively in their workshops. And in 1367, it was allowed to be exported to Cali. So these hillside workings were often extended deeper. Coal was easy to get as only the best and the thickest teams were worked. They were threatened by only two dangers, water and stale air. Stale air, choke damp which could suffocate and kill. The only sign of its presence was the slowly dimming candle. If seen in time, it could be dispersed by fanning the air the miner would do with his jacket or any piece of cloth kept handy for the purpose. Then water. A problem that was to remain with coal mining for the next 600 years. Steadily and constantly it seeped down from the surface into the coal faces and at times threatened to make them unworkable. In this primitive stage of coal mining history, the water was drained away along small tunnels or adits driven to the end of the drift from a hillside or river bank at a point lower than the main entrance. This also helped to ventilate the mine and reduce the danger from choke damp. As the thing moved further in, shorter routes entered the coal and the air. Steep slopes or landways were driven. And then as the seams went deeper, Vertical shafts were sunk, the first real pit shaft. And this was to mean new problems in bringing up the coal. centuries, the mining of coal had developed slowly but steadily in almost every coal field that has worked today. Tyneside, Coley Tyne as Milton later called it, was the largest. In fact, by Tudor times, there were 400 vessels in the Tyne coal fleet. In Elizabeth's reign, coal had been very unpopular. Her Majesty findeth herself greatly grieved and annoyed with the taste and the smoke of the sea coals. But as Britain's sea power grew, wood was needed in vast quantities for shipbuilding and for smelting iron for arms, armor, and cannon. The charcoal needed for smelting one ton of iron destroyed a whole acre of woodland. Parliament had to decree that the burning of wood be restricted 
to fight the Queen's deputy. In the towns, the wood fire became almost wholly a luxury of the nobility. But James I had no objection to coal. And in the 17th century, it became fashionable by royal favor. So coal mining had become an industry. Pits were made larger and deeper, sometimes as much as two or three hundred feet below ground. Increasing numbers of women and children were employed to drag the weighty loads along the rough and sometimes steep roadways. underground transport. But for winding, simple machines were already in use. This cog and rung gin worked by a horse was developed in Cromwell's time. But it left no room at the pit head. An improvement was the whim gin, set up at a little distance from the pit head. From a vertical drum, a strong hemp rope ran over a pulley and so down the shaft. But still, the only power was a horse. Coal mining had become an industry before industrial power was available. This device allowed several cores to be hoisted at once, one above the other. In time, several horses could be used when the pits became deeper. And as the miners dug deeper into the rock, they met a new danger. Now, if choke damp was present and the miner tried to disperse it, he would often waft an explosive mixture of fire damp and air onto his candle. Another dangerous sort of bad air, but of a fiery nature like lightning, which blasts and tears all before it if it take hold of the candle. Men and workings were destroyed by one explosion after another. The only solution was to fire the gas deliberately. Several times a day, firemen, as they were most aptly called, would enter the mine and each in his own way would prepare to fire the pockets of gas. Here, one would hide himself in a shallow hole beneath some timber. Another, often called a penitent from the monk-like nature of his protective rags, would approach the area of danger with a candle on a pole. Then, in one way or another, the gas would be ignited. So the mine was made safe for a few hours. But the problem of water was more serious at this time. Adits could not be used where the belt of hole lay deep under the surface. Something was needed to lift water out of the mine. Many ingenious machines to do this were produced in the 17th century. One method was to adapt a horse gin to turn a chain of buckets, as used in the Middle East today for irrigation. More complex inventions followed. For this was a golden century of art and science, the century of Milton, Wren, Newton, and the Royal Society. The machines of this age were the prologue to the Industrial Revolution. But they were made of wood and wore out too quickly. Their only power was by water, wind, or horse. And this was not enough as the mines became still deeper. Coal owners spent more and more money on drainage, and the price of coal rose alarmingly. The constant, steady seepage of water threatened mine after mine with closure.
One gloomy prophet in the House of Commons complained that the pits would be flooded before the 20 years' lease of the mines expired. But he had not reckoned with the genius of the engineer. As the century closed, man harnessed nature in the shape of steel. 1698. A patent was granted to Captain Savory for a new invention, driven by the impellent force of fire, which will be of great use for draining of mines. Savory was not to succeed, but Thomas Newcomen, some 15 years later, produced a practical engine. At Griff Colliery, the first mechanically propelled machine was installed for pumping water. It replaced 50 horses and saved 750 pounds a year. These engines had to be made by craftsmen in the traditional materials, wood, copper and lead. Iron was still too scarce to be used. Over a hundred of these machines had been installed in the north of England alone by the middle of the 18th century. Then a new partnership arose. Abraham Darby perfected the coking of coal and used it in the smelting of iron. From 1740 onwards, iron was produced chiefly and plentifully by the use of coal, and in its turn, iron helped to produce more coal. With cheap iron, the steam engine was rapidly improved. Although its only function was to pump water and to drain the mine. And with cheap iron, haulage in the coal fields was transformed. Until now, almost the only improvement underground had been a wheelbarrow on planks. This had been used for centuries. Wooden wheels on wooden rails were another idea of the 17th century. Now came iron, and railways improved. Above ground, the rail system in the collieries advanced even more rapidly, and level haulages often ran for several miles. Where the ground sloped, the empty wagons would be pulled up to the pit bank by the full ones which ran down under their own weight on a self-acting inclined plate. Sometimes a horse would pull up the empty. To save the horse unnecessary walking, a special wagon was provided to take him on the downward journey. A privilege, we are told, that the horse highly appreciated. But these railways seldom carried the coal more than a few miles, usually to the nearest seaport or waterway. Canals were built to carry the coal further afield in horse-drawn barges. But horsepower was not enough for this expanding industry. The sun and planet here was devised by James Watt in 1782. Now, rotary motion made it possible for stationary steam engines to raise coal and to draw wagons. A new engineering age had begun. Iron, coal and steam made the last years of the 18th century the starting point of the modern world. Idea followed idea. If steam could turn wheels, why not a steam engine on wheels? Trevithick made the first attempt. He used the same principles as in stationary engines. Blenkinsop carried the idea forward, and the first practical locomotive drew coal at Middleton Colliery. So the coal fields became the birthplace of the railway. Now the Industrial Revolution neared its peak. Coal mining boom. In a hundred years after the Battle of Trafalgar, production per year was to grow from 10 million tons to 225 million tons. To get it meant a vast increase in manpower. I carry the large bits of coal from the wall face to the pit bottom. The weight is used in a hundred ways. 
I don't know how many pounds that is, but it's some weight to carry. I'd not do such a open door with a banjo. I never see daylight now, except on Sundays. I put the cobs along the tram road. It's tight.